Thank you, Carolyn. Well, that's one of my favorites. Okay. Certain hymns or songs, thoughts of friends or loved ones, perhaps your dad, since tomorrow's Father's Day, a story or an event in your life may bring back memories of our past. This is why in my nursing home ministry that we, the theme is on the old gospel songs. Of course, they never get old. Sad thing is that the young people today don't sing these old songs. It's a sad thing because there's beautiful messages there. Of course, these are the ones that these folks grew up on, we grew up on, these are the ones they know. And of course, it's a sing-along program that we use and so forth, so, and it has been quite a blessing, trust me, it is going wonderful, okay. And so, of course, they love to sing these songs, and in many cases, it brings back memories. What would life be back without these precious memories? Okay.
Good afternoon, saints of God. I'm glad to see you here. And uh, all of us, even if we don't know him, all of us have fathers. Some of them deserve to be recognized tomorrow and some of them don't. But nevertheless, I would like to show you a video in case uh, you're wondering what fatherhood is all about and how important fatherhood is, just to glean some inspiration and to give you some idea of how important it is, if you're a man, to be a man of God and to man up. What do 90% of homeless and runaway children, 85% of children with behavioral disorders, 71% of high school dropouts, 75% of youth in drug abuse centers and 85% of all youth in prison have in common? They all come from fatherless homes. There are over 25 million kids right now growing up in a home without their dad. And for them, Father's Day is just another fatherless day. But it doesn't have to be this way. The numbers show that children with involved fathers have higher self-esteem, better grade point averages, and they grow up to become the most compassionate adults. Dads, we are vital. The role we play is world changing. God has given us the ability to completely rewrite the future, not only for our sons and daughters, but for the millions of girls and boys who are right now living without a dad. Now is the time to step up. Our kids need us more than ever. The fatherless need us more than ever. There are kids in this building right now who need a man of God in their lives, a role model, a mentor, someone to say, I'm proud of you. Someone to have their back, someone to affirm them, someone to show the love of Christ to them. Not just anyone, not just a friend, they need a man. So to all the dads out there, reflecting Jesus to their kids, willing to stand up for the abandoned, and giving it all for their family, we say thank you. God is changing the world through you. Your impact will reach further than you can ever imagine, so be watchful. Stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Happy Father's Day. And since tomorrow is Father's Day, I decided to preach today uh, a sermon that will also reflect this fact, relate to that. We are almost at the end of our sermon series, just one sermon left, and I'm going to preach next uh, Sabbath. So, for those of you who have not been uh, with us for a while, hmm, that's my fault, yes, I didn't turn it on, okay, thank you. Uh, for those who have not been with us uh, for the next, uh, for the last uh, several weeks, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we've been uh, studying the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and we had the chance to see the passion through different eyes. We saw the passion through the eyes of Peter who denied uh, Jesus. We saw the passion through the two thieves or should I say criminals who were crucified together with Jesus on the cross. And we saw also the passion of Christ through the eyes of Pilate and the Jewish leaders. All of these angles that we saw the passion of Jesus was through the eyes of human beings. And rightly so because the gospel is written down for human beings. Yet I would like us today to take a different view, a different perspective on the passion of Christ. Have you ever wondered what it felt like, what it looked like, what it, was, what it was like to be like the, the father 
on that Friday. What it felt like to be God the Father and to sacrifice the best you can give to humanity. Thank you, Mary. So, today I would like us to focus on one text, one Bible text, that will tell us a little bit about the perspective of God the Father from the cross. And I would like to tell you first that uh, when you start looking for God's presence during the Passion narrative, God is, uh, the Father is almost absent and awfully silent. There are only three occasions on which the Father's presence kind of shows up a little bit, but God hides. And some people have, have misinterpreted uh, this silence and hiding of the Father. The first occasion when uh, the Father's presence kind of glimmers in the darkness is Jesus in Gethsemane. Three times Jesus approaches his Father and he prays this passionate prayer in Aramaic and the Gospel of Mark gives us the first word of Jesus' prayer. And the first word is Abba. Abba is this uh, Aramaic uh, word that a Jewish girl, a Jewish boy will use for their dad. And actually Jesus taught his disciples to pray Abba, Father. And several texts in the New Testament show us that uh, the disciples across accepted this Aramaic expression. And Abba means daddy, something like our daddy. And it's affectionate way that a toddler or a very young child is going to use toward his or her father. Yet Jesus in his 30s still addresses God as daddy. And this is very unique. And he taught his disciples to think about God as a good, good father. Yet, interestingly enough, even though throughout his ministry, God always answered Jesus' prayers. God always affirmed his presence to show his love and affection for his son. When his son got baptized, God shouted through the heavens and said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well, well pleased. I'm proud of you, my son. God was the one who, when the Jewish people in the temple was, were judging Jesus and uh, denying his divinity, he shouted from heaven and some people said, oh, it was a thunder. And other people said, no, I recognize this was the, the, the voice of God, recognizing his only beloved son. Yet now in Gethsemane, God the Father is painfully silent. The second, uh, but uh, before I tell you the second time when God showed a little bit of his presence, even though God was awfully silent, after Jesus accepted the bitter cup of suffering, God sent a messenger, an angel, to tell his son, your dad loves you. Yet, strangely enough, God does not appear to tell him that. The second time when God's presence becomes more tangible was on Golgotha between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon, between the sixth and the ninth uh, Roman hour, when mysterious darkness envelops the cross. And I can tell you it was not a solar eclipse because Passover, and this was just the day before Passover, Passover is always on a full moon day. You cannot have solar eclipse during the full moon. So it was not a natural phenomenon that occurred on the cross. It was God causing the darkness. And I would, love, I would like to go even a step further and tell you that God was actually hiding God the Father was hiding in the darkness. He was there watching his son, but he did, did not give him any indication 
that he is listening. And the son was praying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Up to this moment, Jesus always prays, Abba. Now he prays, my God, you're so distant, I cannot see you, I cannot feel you, I cannot touch you. Why have you forsaken me? And the third time when God's presence is shown during the Passion narrative is when Jesus breathed his last and says, it is finished. And the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27 that when Jesus pronounced these words and died, the veil of the temple was split, divided into, torn into, from top to bottom. There is no human power that can do that. Historian Josephus tells us that at least 20 men were needed to put up and take down the veil of the temple. And historian Josephus was a priest, he knows. So it was a very heavy uh, fabric, very thick material woven several times so that nothing will perspire between the most holy place and the holy place. So these are the three places in the passion narrative when God actually shows up. And though his presence is so kind of hidden and his silence is deafening, I would like to tell you that if we do not understand God's silence, especially His silence on the cross, how are we going to understand His words? Sometimes just being silent preaches a louder message than tons of words. Do you know what are the cases in the Bible when God is silent? I would like to give you just uh, two examples. The Bible tells us that Abraham was a friend of God. And there was a constant communication between God and Abraham flowing. As a matter of fact, the Bible gives us eight occasions on which God the Father spoke directly to Abraham face to face. And I'm sure there were even more than that. But there is one period in Abraham's life, 13 years, when God is awfully silent in the life of Abraham. And it happened right after he took Hagar as his second wife. And he begat the son of the flesh called Ishmael, the human invention, the human solution for God's promise. And for 13 years, God was silent in Abraham's life. Do you know that? David is probably the most prolific psalmist in the Bible. He wrote many psalms. And he was writing almost through his uh, entire life except there was one period of his life, about a year, a little bit uh, over a year, When God is silent and does not give any words of inspiration to David to write. And this was after he messed up his life with Bathsheba. So God is giving a message that sin separates us from his presence. And here on the cross he was trying to give us the message that Jesus has become from Gethsemane on Jesus has become the ultimate sinner who was carrying the fault and the sin and the guilt of the whole humanity. And here comes the text that I wanted us to study today. I assume that all of you have heard this text. Do you know what 316 stands for? The numbers of hope? Anyone? John 316. We know this text from uh, those of you who have been brought up as Christians from babies. Yet oftentimes we do not pay attention to what it says. 
Let's, let's uh, recite it together. I didn't put it on the screen because I know that most of you know it by heart. So, ready? Go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> Did you notice who gave his only begotten son? Who is this God? This is the Father. How many of you here are fathers? Uh, uh, let me see your hands. Anyone here besides my wife that loves me? Anyone? Okay. I see a few hands and I see uh, Rich. Rich, would you please sacrifice one of your girls or uh, Jonathan or Ben for me? Would you crucify him? <laughs> okay, you don't love, love, love me that much. Listen, friends. It is easier to sacrifice yourself than to let your child be sacrificed. It is, uh, if someone asks me, will I allow my daughter to suffer or rather me suffer? I will say, I would like to suffer. I don't want to see her suffer. And do you grasp what the Word of God is telling us here? For God so loved the world that He gave His only beloved, begotten Son. In a sense, God is telling us, I love you more than my Son. Wow. It's difficult to grasp. I, I understand. It's sometimes we're so used to this theology that this text passes by our ears and our hearts and nothing happens. Do you know what else uh, this text is telling us? Some people believe that Jesus loves us. Actually, most of the Christians believe that Jesus loved them. But somehow when you interview Christians, they have the doubt that the Father loves them the same. God, uh, God the Father is a little bit more meaner, a little bit stricter, and Jesus had to please and appease him. Please don't be angry with these people. I love them. Would you please lo love them because I love them? If you have really paid attention to what John 3.16 says, it says, God loved the world first, so then He gave His Son. It didn't happen the other way around. It didn't happen that the Son died on the cross and then finally the Father said, okay, because my Son made such a big sacrifice for these people, I'm going to love them too. Oftentimes we really do not pay attention to that. And do you know something else? There are really people who believe that God suffers of kind of a split personality. In the Old Testament, He's a demanding, mean-spirited, uh, not very uh, lenient God. But in the New Testament, He's forgiving, lenient, loving. John 3.16 tells us that nothing has changed in, the, in God the Father. As a matter of fact, the New Testament, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, tells us that God gave His sacrifice, ordained Him to be a sacrifice long before the world was created. He loved you and me with this humongous, unexplainable love before even we did anything wrong. And He decided that in case we do, He is going to give His Son. So, the cross does not change the heart of the Father. The cross only shows how much He loves you. On Golgotha, we see the length to which God the Father goes so that we can have the chance to spend eternity with Him. Through the cross, not just Jesus, but God the Father is spreading His arms and opening His heart and He says, I love you that much. Through the passion narrative and through the silence of God, God is proclaiming three times. When my son was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was pleading with me, Daddy, would you please save me from the suffering, save me from this bitter cup? I decided to give him the silent treatment so that you'll never feel that I'm giving the silent treatment to you. 
When my son on the cross was crying out his soul, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I didn't answer his call so that you will know that I can answer yours anytime. And you'll never have to feel abandoned because I'm with you always till the end of this world. And when my son breathed his last and I tore in two the veil that divided my presence from you, I wanted to tell you I'm here for you forever. And you can have eternity with me face to face. I love you that much. And I know how human nature works. I know that uh, we hear all these things, yet it's so difficult for us to internalize it. It's so difficult for this information that I just shared with you to travel these 18 inches from here to here. But I've learned something from Jesus. Most of his teachings, Jesus did in stories. I'm going to tell you a story. One of the most celebrated episodes of uh, Spanish heroism took place during the civil war in Spain that raged between 1936 and 1939. A civil revolution, civil uh, uprising broke out in Spain and it was fueled with the communist money of the Soviet Union. And they not just sent weapon, weapons and money, they also sent people and recruited people from the Soviet Union, from different countries. People were signing uh, for this war from all over the world to go and fight so that Spain can become a communist country. It was the summer of 1936 when the city of Toledo, this is how they pronounced it in Spain, not Toledo, Toledo. The city of Toledo was almost completely taken over by the rebel forces. There were only 1,300 people, both civilians and military troops, who were inside of the fortress of Alcazar. And they were fighting bravely under the command of Colonel Jose uh, Moscardo Ituarte. And I would like to show you a picture. These are, these are real pictures from 1936. Do you recognize this flag? Yeah, this flag was waving not in uh, the Soviet Union, it was waving right there. In the, on the streets of Toledo. And this is what the fortress of Alcazar looked like from the bombing and uh, artillery. Later they rebuilt Alcazar, so if you go to Spain you'll see the rebuilt fortress. But it happened on July 23rd, 1936. The communist commander, Candido Cabello, reached over the phone the commander of uh, the defenders of uh, Alcazar, Colonel Jose uh, Mascardo, and triumphantly announced over the phone, Colonel, we have your son. Luis is with us, we have your son, we captured your son. And to prove that he is not uh, bluffing, he gave the phone over to the son of Colonel Mascardo. And the father asked, what's happening, son? They captured me, dad, Luis replied. And they're telling me that they're gonna execute me right away if you don't surrender and give them the fortress of, Alca uh, of uh, Alcazar. There was a long silence. The father was struggling with the next words he was about to say. 
saw the son, Luis, broke the silence and said, Dad, they're serious, they're gonna execute me. What will you say? What are you gonna do? And finally, after this long and uh, heavy pause, Colonel Mascardo told his son, son, you know that your mom and I, we love you very much. Actually, there is nobody else in this world that we love more. Yet, this is what I'm gonna tell you, son. Today is the day for you to become a hero and a saint. So, shout proudly, long live King Jesus and long live Spain and die as a hero and as a saint. Then uh, Commander Cabello took over the phone and Colonel Mascardo told him, Alcazar will never surrender. I will rather give my son up than let the communistic pest overtake my country and see millions upon millions of sons and daughters of Spain suffering after this cruel regime. And then he hung, hung up the phone. After that, Colonel Mascardo uh, knelt down and started praying for his son. And while the tears were rolling down his cheeks, he heard a shot in the middle of the night. And he knew that the life of his son was over. Almost 2,000 years ago, another father received a call from his son. Abba, they have surrounded me and they are going to spit in my face. They are going to scourge me and crucify me. What do you say, Abba? And there was a long, long silence. What do you say, Father? And then the father sent a messenger to tell his boy, I love you, son. But I cannot see and I cannot live with the idea of billions upon billions of my sons and daughters suffering under the cruel regime of Satan. So this is what I'm going to tell you, son. Today is your day to become a hero and a saint. I love you, son. And I love you too, Dad. And I love the people you love too. So today I would like to ask you, what would you have done had you been 2,000 years ago there? What if your son, what if your daughter was the one that had to lay down her life or his life so that those who do, do not deserve life have to live? I know what I would have done as a father. I would have said, no way. Do you realize what God the Father did that day? He let the sinners go and the son suffer. Sometimes for us it's so difficult to even grasp this concept, especially for those of us who have either grown in a fatherless home or we've grown in a home where the person that uh, was supposed to be a father was everything else but not a father. 40% of uh, children in America grow in such homes. Maybe some of us who are sitting uh, here in these pews are people who cannot resonate with the idea of God being the Father. 
Actually, some of, yous, some of you have been spiritually, emotionally, and physically abused by a so-called father figure. And every time you, you hear father, shivers go down your spine. Today I'm here to tell you that our Heavenly Father is nothing like that. Don't you ever project on our good heavenly dad all these things that some earthly jerk has done for you and to you. Because God the Father is not like that. God is a good father. And for those of you men who are fathers, future fathers, grandfathers, or even if you are childless but you are a father figure to someone. May I ask you today to man up. Because there are people in this world who refuse to believe in a heavenly father because of you, because of me. If we messed up, how we relate to them, how we play God the Father for them. Shortly before Jesus went to the, uh, to the cross, shortly before he went to plead with his father, he turned toward his disciples and prayed a prayer, the longest prayer in Jesus' ministry. Public prayer. That he offers to all of his children. And this prayer begins like that. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. I would like to pause here. Jesus uses a very strange language to, to speak about his cross. In the Gospel of John, every single time when he says the son is going to be glorified or glorify your son, he speaks about his crucifixion. And he says to the Father, would you please help me to glorify you? by dying on the cross. And then he continues in his prayer that he, the Son, should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And then Jesus is telling us the secret of our human existence, the purpose of our human existence. He says, and this is the eternal life. Do you remember uh, what uh, Jesus told us, the Father tells us, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. Now, Jesus is telling us what eternal life looks like. Eternal life is not going endlessly to the bars, getting drunk, getting late, uh, getting a huge amount of money, having successful business. Jesus says, the eternal life is this. That they may know you, that they may know God the Father, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. If you want to know what eternal life is all about, Jesus says, eternal life is to get to know God as a true Father. Those who do not know Him, they do not live a uh, eternal life. They just exist. It's a miserable existence. Knowing God as a loving dad will transform your spiritual life, will transform every area of your life. People who do not feel loved do heinous things in this life. This is why 85% of these fatherless children end up in juvenile uh, facilities. Or, well, should I say the other way? 89% of the people in the juvenile facilities are fatherless. And some are fatherless even though they have fathers at home. But knowing God as your father can transform your life even though your father may have been a jerk, your, ma uh, your, your father may have been deserted you, and he may send even shivers down your spine when you think about him. God is not like that. Today I would like to ask you on behalf of God to see him for who he really is, a loving father. And I would like to invite you to sing together with me. For some of you it will be a new song, the song that I'm going to put on the screen. So let's reconsecrate our lives to him.
Please take out of your bulletin the yellow connection card. And here are the steps I would like to suggest. First, Lord, human fathers have given me a distorted picture of you. Help me to not project my disappointments on you. Second, Heavenly Father, Thank you for loving me so much as to sacrifice your son for me. And finally, I want to be a father, I want to be a grandfather, I want to be a father figure to someone who will reflect the Heavenly Father in a way that will help my children, grandchildren and all the children around me to fall in love with him. May God bless you. And to all the fathers and all the father figures in this life, happy Father's Day. I am thine.
just bow our heads for the benediction. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of eternal life. And thank you for your love that we cannot even comprehend. A love that the book Desire of Ages tells us will take us eternity to grasp. Would you please bless us today, not to be only the consumers of your divine love, but to be transformed by it and to also reflect it to others, to become the men and women of God you have called us to be so that others can come close to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.